Welcome to the Mystery Incorporated Iceberg. The chart features interesting facts and other pieces of information relating to this beloved Scooby-Doo incarnation. I became a fan of the show right as it came out, and I've noticed a massive resurgence of the series this year. I've actually wanted to do this video for over a year now, and it's finally time. Mitch Watson Mitch is the main producer of Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated and also helped to write the total of 9 episodes. He also voices several characters in the series, such as Ethan, Dylan, the farmer, that amusement park attendee who wants you to ride the nauseator. Hey, hey, ride the nauseator. No waiting, ever. Mr. Gabble Goggle Fordia, and many other small roles. Mitch is also known for producing other animated shows, such as Beware the Batman, all Hail King Julian, Big Nate, and Duckman. Actually, a few other entries in this iceberg come from an interview he did with JB and Millie in July of last year. I recommend watching it that in full, I'll link it below. Spike Brandt and Tony Zervone This duo also acted as supervising directors on the series, along with having a big hand in directing episodes. They have an incredibly extensive resume with Warner Brothers, as they also worked on many Looney Tunes projects, many Tom and Jerry films, and other Scooby projects. Frank Welker Perhaps one of the best voice actors of all time, Frank has been involved with the Scooby-Doo franchise since the beginning. In fact, he's been voicing Fred Jones since the original 1969 series. He began voicing Scooby-Doo in the early 2000s with What's New Scooby-Doo, and continued with this show. Mystery Inc. is actually the first show in the franchise to not have Scooby speak with R in each word. Due to his immense talent, Frank was able to voice other characters in this show, such as Barty Blake, The Freak of Crystal Cove, Chargar Gothicon, Night Fright, The Manzacore, The Man Crab, The Gnome, and a load of others. He even voices a few old Hanna-Barbera characters he voiced in the past, such as Dino Mutt, Jabberjaw, and Speed Buggy. The guy is an absolute legend and greatly contributed to this show. Patrick Warburton most known for playing Joe Swanson in Family Guy, Patrick has one of the most iconic voices in media. For this series, he plays Sheriff Bronson Stone, a fan-favorite character who might possibly return in the near future. Sheriff Stone? Like what's with the little hat? It's my art beret. I wear it because deep in my soul I am an artist. It also keeps my head warm right in the center, making my brains feel all toasty. Patrick is also known for voicing Kronk in The Emperor's New Groove, The Tick, Buzz Lightyear, and Brock in Venture Brothers. Matthew Lillard Matthew, of course, played Shaggy in the two theatrical Scooby-Doo films, and replaced Casey Kasem as Shaggy's voice in 2009. Mr. Inc. was his first official voice role as Shaggy, and has now become iconic, so much so that his name has become synonymous with the character, despite his range and slew of other roles. In fact, when it was announced that he would be playing William Afton in the upcoming Five Nights at Freddy's movie, Many memed on how legendary that sounds. Many forget his role as Stu in the first Scream movie and other projects he's been a part of. Grey Delisle Grey began voicing Daphne in 2001 Scooby-Doo in the Cyber Chase, continuing that role to this day. She is an incredibly recognizable voice, though her range is incredible. You'll recognize her for voicing Azula and Avatar, Vicky and the Fairly Odd Parents, Betty Brand and Spectacular Spider-Man, and a ton of others. Daphne is pretty much her biggest role, though she does voice other smaller characters in Mystery Incorporated, such as Paula Rogers, Greta Gator, Baba Yaga, the Vampire Waitress, and Kai Horifico. Mindy Kohn Rounding out the gang's voice cast is Mindy, who plays Velma. She began playing the character in What's New Scooby-Doo, though quit the role in 2015 due to battling breast cancer. She did make a recovery in 2017, though the role of Velma has since been filled with Kate Micucci. Mystery Incorporated was her final voice role in a Scooby-Doo show, though she did play Velma in a few more directed DVD movies and Lego Dimensions. Vivica A. Fox Vivica is well known for her roles in Kill Bill and Independence Day, along with one of my favorite films, Cool Cat Saves the Kids. And where is Cool Cat? There he is! In the show, she plays Angel Dynamite, aka Cassidy Williams. She legit plays this character fantastically, and there really was no better choice than her. Episode 1 Sneak Peek The series premiere, titled Beware the Beast from Below, aired on April 5th, 2010. This was a full three months before the rest of the series started airing. It was a sneak peek of sorts, something that Cartoon Network rarely did. 
It re-aired on July 12, 2010, followed by the next 12 episodes until late October 2010. Two other fun facts about this episode. For one, it aired the same night Adventure Time premiered, though that show has a second episode premiering right after it. And two, the title not only refers to the slime monster in the episode, but also the evil entity buried beneath Crystal Cove. Hiatuses Mystery Incorporated went through tons of hiatuses throughout its run. First was after the 13th episode from October 2010 to May 2011. After season 1 finished, it took an entire year for season 2 to air. And once 15 episodes aired within the course of 3 weeks, it went on hiatus one final time from August 2012 to March 2013. So why was this the case? Well, the answer actually lies in the iceberg's next entry. Cartoon Network hated the show. Yep, you heard that correctly. In the aforementioned podcast, Mitch Watson mentions how the show was pulled off the schedule 12 different times by Cartoon Network. The first time this happened was due to an overshadowing Adventure Time, a series which the network wanted to be a bigger hit. It of course did, but Mystery Inc. would get screwed over. This explains why the hiatuses were so long, and why the second season had episodes air so close together. As soon as a new batch of episodes was finished, they would be aired as soon as possible before the next batch was ready. Another reason why this might have been the case was due to how dark the show was. Warner Brothers were the ones fully supportive of the series. Big on Netflix After the series concluded, Netflix would buy the streaming rights to it along with many other Warner Brothers shows. It became a massive hit, particularly around 2017 to 2020. For a few years, it exclusively streamed on HBO Max, now it's simply called Max, but recently it reappeared on Netflix again. Mystery Inc. gained new popularity in early 2023 due to some horrific decisions done for the Scooby-Doo franchise. Happy Tapioca This became a decently popular meme around Spring 2018 due to a clip being shown from the episode The Shrieking Madness. In the episode, Fred hangs out with a frat house, who insists he plays a game called Happy Tapioca. It consists of him being blindfolded and submerged in pudding, in as little clothes as possible. He's even shown about to do it before Scooby rescues him. Jimmy Kimmel included it in his segment, This Week in Unnecessary Censorship. So instead of sounding like this... My new brothers are gonna teach me a move called Happy Tapioca! I don't know what it is, but apparently, uh... I'll be blindfolded and submerged in pudding. <laughs> See you around. It sounded like this. My new brothers are going to teach me a move called Happy Tapioca. I don't know what it is, but apparently uh, I'll be blindfolded and submerged in pudding. <laughs> See you around. An Urban Dictionary definition was written the same week the segment aired, on October 22nd, 2010. It, paired with the original clip, implies that the show wrote a hilarious innuendo into the show, which is not exactly the case. I'm unable to find the original, even on Hulu, but let me know if you can. I'm sure the idea of such a hazing ritual is inappropriate in nature, just not that way. Jason Wyatt Jason is one of the series' producers alongside Mitch Watson. He's notable due to the character of Jason Wyatt being directly named after him. If you don't remember, Jason is a stereotypical fat nerd who has a creepy crush on Velma. His mom gets locked up in prison, and he makes a cameo appearance in season 2. You may confuse the name with the late Derek J. Wyatt, who designed the new look of Mystery Inc. Udo Kier Udo was a famous German actor who plays Professor Pericles, along with doing the voices of the shadowy figure, Disguise, and the evil pizza. He's been acting since the 1960s, but became more prominent in the 90s and 2000s with roles in Ace Ventura, Iron Sky, Call of Duty, Command & Conquer, and recently in the show Hunters. Strangely enough, he plays an elderly Adolf Hitler in the latter. Ich habe in sechs Jahren und einem Tag Millionen von Menschen getötet. Mehr als Schinges kann in 200 Jahren. According to Mitch, when Udo came to record the lines of Pericles, he'd get really into character and flap his coat like pseudo wings. This would create too much noise, so he ended up performing his lines while shirtless. What a chad. Mark Hamill. There's no real need to introduce this guy. He plays Luke Skywalker, the Joker, Skips, Lord Ozai, and many other roles. In Mystery Inc., he plays Crybaby Clown, a villain with many traits similar to the Joker. It's a mix of being a parody and its own character, as him being a man baby is a more zany idea. 
This was a two-time guest role, but he's such a famous voice actor that he had to be pretty high up on the iceberg. Linda Cardellini Linda played Velma in the two live-action Scooby-Doo films directed by James Gunn. Despite her not appearing as Velma in the series, she plays the former rival and eventual romantic interest of Velma, Hot Dog Water, though of course she actually goes by Marcy. Linda has had many voice roles ranging from the MCU and various TV shows, though many will recognize her more for voicing Wendy in Gravity Falls and CJ in Regular Show. John O'Hurley John voices Skipper Shelton along with various background characters. He's had too many roles to list, though he's most notable for hosting Family Feud from 2006 to 2010. Lewis Black Lewis is a stand-up comedian with a really recognizable voice. Mystery Inc. he plays Mr. E, aka Ricky Owens. He's also been in some very weirdly named movies, oh, and played Anger in Inside Out. Gary Cole Gary is yet another prolific actor with loads of roles in the animation world. Here he plays Mayor Fred Jones Jr., aka Mayor Dad. Kate Higgins She voiced multiple characters in Mystery Incorporated, including Mayor Nettles, Principal Quinlan, Motor Bjorkland, the Mayan Priestess, Lieutenant Kasansky, and a few others. Harlan Ellison Harlan was a famous writer mostly active during the 1950s to the 1980s. He has coined many iconic works of science fiction and even wrote some of the best Star Trek episodes. His most famous works include I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, The Beast That Shouted Love and The Heart of the World, Dangerous Visions, and Death Bird Stories. He voiced himself in two episodes of the show, first being the 12th episode The Shrieky Madness. He appeared as a fictionalized version of himself based on what he looked like in the 1970s. He shows disdain for the works of H.P. Haycraft, an obvious parody of H.P. Lovecraft, though the two end up becoming friends and plan on writing a book together. Harlan actually wrote the introduction to the short story compilation novel Shadows of Death, terrifying tales by H.P. Lovecraft. He also cameos in the final episode, inviting the gang to study at Miskatonic University. Twin Peaks during the second half of season 2, Scooby has a recurring dream of seeing Nova and this little dancing man in a strange room with red curtains. While seemingly being a bizarre reference to the 90s TV series Twin Peaks, it ends up being a major plot point, and it's honestly surprising that such a dark and messed up show as such as Twin Peaks would be showcased this much on a Cartoon Network show. Michael J. Anderson, the man who plays the man from another place, even came back to voice the dancing man and his real world counterpart. Professor Horatio Karen. Horror movie references. Much of the series episodes reference classic horror movies, sometimes to the point where it becomes way too obvious. I'll list the best examples, but if you want to see them all, just read the Wikipedia guide. Howl of the Fred Hound references the first Terminator movie, even using similar music cues and ending with the killer robot getting crushed in a factory. Escape from Mystery Manor has major Saw vibes to it. Night Terrors has many homages to The Shining. The Man in the Mirror references the 1984 movie Night of the Comet, with the scenes in the Mirror World. And of course, Chargar Gothicon is based on the Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. D. Bradley Baker One of the most versatile voice actors of all time, who has had a role in so many different movies and TV shows, most famously, he voiced Perry the Platypus, the clones in Star Wars The Clone Wars and The Bad Batch, Number 4 in Kids Next Door, and basically all animal sound effects in cartoons and movies. He plays loads of roles in Mystery Inc. alone, including Officer Johnson, The Hodag, Gene Shepard, The Headless Horror and Its Shrunken Head, The Sly Mutant, Junk, Worker Number 1, Tom and Tub, The Creek Stoffa Bots, and loads more. James Arnold Taylor James is in a similar boat to D. Bradley Baker when it comes to having various animated voice roles. I mean, this is the guy who simultaneously voices Obi-Wan Kenobi and Johnny Test. In the show, he plays George Avocados. That's Avocados. Shut up, bro. Rung Latterton, Benson Furman, Friar Sarah, and some background characters. Tia Carrera. Tia is an actress who voiced both Judy Reeves and Amy Cavanaugh from the episode The Siren's Song. Tim Matheson. Tim is an actor who actually voiced the old Hanna-Barbera character Johnny Quest. Here he plays Judy's husband, Brad Childs. Frances Conroy Frances is an actress known for voicing Angelie Dinkley in the series, though of course has had hundreds of other roles in her name. 
Clancy Brown. Yes, this is the guy who voices Mr. Krabs. Dude has a really recognizable voice like many other voice actors mentioned in this iceberg. Clancy voices both Hebediah Grimm and the evil entity himself. Matt Lanter. Matt is most known for voicing Anakin Skywalker in The Clone Wars, though here he voices Baylor Hotner, an obvious parody of that Twilight Shark Boy dude. An interesting parallel is that Baylor's alter ego is voiced by Mark Hamill, who also plays, well, Luke Skywalker. Mixed Reviews In that interview with Mitch Watson I mentioned earlier, he retells how him and a few other crew members would troll cartoon fan sites, specifically a site called Toon Zone, which left a negative review of Mystery Incorporated. Many were mixed on the show as a whole when it premiered, due to not liking the darker tone and the character relationships. Instead of letting the criticism get to him, Mitch would thrive on it and paid attention to the happenings of these websites. This was even where he learned about the hatred for Scrappy-Doo, leading to one of the best jokes in the show. Wow, I haven't seen- Look away, Daphne. We all promised each other that we would never speak of him. Not ever! Ed Machine's death. I dedicated the section for this because some don't even realize that this character canonically died. In the season 1 finale, Ed arrives home after rescuing Shaggy and Scooby from the Freak and dropping them off at Angel's place. He finds Pericles there, who wants to deliver a message to Ed's boss, Mr. E. This isn't a spoken message though, but instead a metaphorical one. He begins tearing at Ed Machine's face as the scene fades out. It's one of the darkest moments of the show, and I feel like it's not brought up enough. We never see him again besides the good version of him appearing in the world between worlds. DVD releases. Multiple DVDs were released of the series, which I own a lot of. In fact, that's where I get my footage from. Volume 1 contains the first four episodes and was released in early 2011. The version I have comes with episodes from two other Scooby series. Volume 2 has the next four episodes and was released in May 2011. Volume 3 has the next four and came out in September 2011. After that, the people who released these DVDs said, screw it, and put the rest of Season 1 in Volume 4, releasing it in early 2012. The complete first season DVD was released in October 2013. Season 2 was only split into two volumes halfway, one releasing in November 2012 and the other in June 2013. The complete Season 2 DVD is the rarest of them all and was released in October 2014. It's up on Amazon for a resounding $200. Episode 5 Re-Edits Here's an interesting piece of lost media. The fifth episode of Mystery Inc., titled The Song of Mystery, received some pushback due to how intense the original version was, specifically the scene where the gang is attacked by K. Horrifico's army of spookified children. The presentation and music in the scene was too intense. It's unknown what else was different about the episode, or if anything remains of the original. Billy West. Billy is an extremely well-known voice actor who's played Ren and Stimpy, Elmer Fudd, Zim, and half the cast of Futurama. He even played Shaggy in the Zombie Island movie. In Mystery Inc., he guest stars in two episodes, one of the second episode where he plays Gunther Gator, that Hot Topic looking dude with the Slenderman-like body. In Season 2, he voices multiple characters in the Art of Darkness episode, Randy Warsaw, one of the art hipsters, and Butch Furbanks. That last character has such a unique and distinct voice, even for Billy. Until I came to work for you, Randy Warsaw, you changed me. You transformed me, molded me into a, a dark band leader, playing and singing horrible intellectual music. Hinden Walsh. You'll recognize Hinden as the voice of Starfire, Princess Bubblegum, Harley Quinn, and loads of other characters. Here she voices Alice May and her two alter egos, the Ghost Girl and the Obliteratrix. Really enough, she's not credited as the ghost girl, though it's not that big of a mistake. George Sakai George hardly needs an introduction, but I'll do a quick one anyways. He's a famous Japanese actor who's been performing since the 1950s. He gained fame for portraying Commander Sulu in the original Star Trek series and movies, and has loads of other roles to his name. Despite being Japanese, he plays a Chinese man named Mr. Wang, who dresses up as the White Wizard to steal all the dragon rings. His counterpart is voiced by James Hong, who is actually Chinese and has a similarly recognizable voice. Maurice LaMarche Maurice voices Vincent Van Gogh, a character originally voiced by the late Vincent Price. His voice can be heard in other characters like Brain from Picking the Brain, Yosemite Sam, and Father from The Kids Next Door. 
Jeff Bennett. This man has one of the longest and most impressive filmographies I've ever seen, which includes playing Johnny Bravo, Shocker, The Joker, and like 200 others. In Mystery Inc, he plays Gary in Season 2, Blaine LeFranc, Dougal McGuinness, and Emmanuel Raffalo. Most interesting of all is that he plays Mr. E in the episode Scare Bear. I guess Louis Black couldn't record for that episode, so they temporarily replaced him. Funny thing is, it's hard to tell as that's how good a voice actor Jeff is. Understood. But let's not forget, little angel. I brought you back to Crystal Cove. We're both in this together. Not so excellent, however, is the fact that it didn't work. That idiot trap fiend found a way to blow up my bomb, and the gang walks free. Casey Kasem. Casey is, of course, a famous radio host, and he voiced Shaggy in the original Scooby-Doo series, along with a bunch of its continuations. His final role as Shaggy was in 2009's Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword, though he's uncredited as Shaggy's dad, Colton, in the show. This was his last role before sadly passing away in fall 2013. Crystal Cove Online This was a free-to-play game found on Cartoon Network's website, coinciding with each episode in Season 1. You play through each episode's events, searching for clues in various locations before fighting the monster in a boss battle. There are various power-ups, weapons, and maps to play in. You can even complete side quests to win prizes, and these are essential to completing the game 100%. Once all 52 of those are complete along with finishing the 26 episodes, one final mystery can be solved. Here you fight 7 of the previous bosses in different locations while finding weird versions of the planisphere disc. In the end you fight the freak and wake up from the dream to realize a clue spells out the name of the hot sauce. Sadly this game was not updated after mid-2011, meaning season 2's events were never incorporated. In fact, George Avocados, that's Avocados. Shut up, was made the new mayor. It's a weird yet enjoyable flash game, which I have actually been using as background footage throughout the iceberg, and I'll be mentioning it again later on in the video. Boron Boron is the strangest one off character in the show and has a really small amount of screen time. She's voiced by Grey Delisle and is meant as a guide to lead the Mystery Inc. gang to the Conquistador ship. After that, she vanishes and is never seen again. Besides that, her only other purpose was to make references to Castaway, with Gary and Ethan's lucky soccer ball. If you have any ideas about what her this character was supposed to be, let me know in the comments below. Number 39 In the episode A Haunting in Crystal Cove, Fred Jones Sr. uses this password-protected safe to secure his piece of the planispheric disc. The password itself is 39 pound. This happens to be the episode number in which the disc is put back together. Could this be a coincidence? Maybe. If it were any other show. Pericles Plushies Mitch Watson mentions that he and Tony Cervone each have a plushy version of Professor Pericles. These were meant to be officially released as toys, but that never happened. No images of these can be found online, though Mitch states in the interview that it's in storage somewhere. I just love the idea of kids falling asleep with a stuffed animal of a genocidal parrot who wants to take over the world. Planet X. Also known as Nibiru, this is a hypothetical planet that exists outside the reach of our solar system. It is also known as the Tenth Planet, and it became instrumental to the plot of Mystery Incorporated halfway through Season 2. This idea came about due to Michael Ryan, a writer who came on board halfway through the show. He was obsessed over the idea of Planet X, and pitched it to both Tony and Mitch. The three would hang out in Mike's office and get drunk, coming up with crazy ideas for the show and putting them up on a board. Another interesting fact is that the encyclopedia Velma reads in Wrath of Krampus about Nibiru is the Wikipedia article on the Nibiru Cataclysm, word for word. Originally meant for British TV. Yes, this show was originally targeted for the British version of Cartoon Network. The crew only had to deal with British standards and practices, with the only American influences being some of the heads of Warner Brothers. This gave them free reign, though the only thing that the executives didn't like was the relationship between Shaggy and Velma, which they saw as weird. Season 3 While the show did wrap up all of its loose ends at the end of Season 2, there was talks of a third season being made. Mitch Watson has confirmed this multiple times, and it seems Season 3 did begin some form of pre-production. Though Cartoon Network didn't want to renew the show, and it ended up being rebooted as Be Cool Scooby-Doo. 
This is expected as Cartoon Network did not like the show one bit, and wanted to replace it as soon as they could. In an interview with Mitch on ScoobyAddicts.com, he said, I wouldn't have ended the show any different. Tony and I always intended it to end like it did. We did actually work out what would happen if there was a third season, which they wanted overseas where the show was a global hit, but unfortunately it never happened. If you've watched the whole series, you know that SDMI was a prequel to the original series in the 60s. Our plan was to pick up the third season with the gang driving off to meet Harlan Ellison at college and solving mysteries along the way, with many of the classic monsters popping up. We were also going to introduce a brand new long-term mystery that revolved around the college. We had it ready to go, but unfortunately two seasons was it. He is open to doing a third season in the future, but that most likely won't happen even with the show still being as popular as it is. Velma and Marcy's relationship It has been confirmed by multiple people who worked on the show that these two were canonically dating, though only after it ended. Mitch was the first person to reveal it in an interview years ago, and Greta Lyle referred to Hot Dog Water as Velma's girlfriend in a 2018 interview. Say I'm a fan of uh, Mystery Incorporated. Oh, me too. That's one of my favorite ones. Oh, yes. absolutely. Yes. That's. I love that Velma kind of has a girlfriend on it. Oh, and just there's yeah. so much going on. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think there's any kind of about it. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure Hot Dog Velma Water just... and her just like, yeah. Yeah. Also, she reveals that she has Linda Cardellini's phone number saved as Hot Dog Water, which is pretty funny to me. But the final bit of confirmation came from Tony Cervone who was asked about it via Instagram. He said, Velma and Shaggy's relationship was a disaster because it was wrong for her, not because Shaggy chose Scooby. Velma and Marcy certainly have couple feelings, but probably did not have the opportunity to act on them. After the reset, they are absolutely a couple. This was something that was always implied in the show and not something made up years later. It just couldn't have been expressed too clearly at the time of airing, but the subtlety really works. Edgar Allan Poe. Now, the original source for this has been taken down, it seems, but Pericles' concept designs were greatly inspired by the 19th century poet Edgar Allan Poe. His drawings are incredibly weird, especially the ones where he has a Hannibal Lecter mask on. The Spanish Conquistadors are brainwashed. The show implies that the Spanish Conquistadors who explored the Americas during the 15th and 16th century slaughtered entire civilizations due to the evil entity's influence. This is yet another dark aspect of the show that really never gets talked about. I mean, there's even a scene showing them burning and slaughtering the natives. Later in life and in death, their leader, Fernando El Aguirre, is shown being haunted by the screams of the innocent people he slayed. Don Knotts. This really weird background character, who happens to be voiced by Jeff Bennett, is inspired by the look of Don Knotts. Don was a well-known actor and comedian from the mid-20th century, who actually appeared as himself in the 70s series of the new Scooby-Doo movies. Shaggy's Tight Pants In the fifth episode, Velma gives Shaggy a pair of new pants, which don't really fit him that well. At the end of the episode, he's shown giving them back to her, but that's not the last time we see them. In the season 2 premiere, Velma incorporates it into her Rorschach costume. Fox Tell Australia's Marathon Despite the show not airing anymore, a marathon of Mystery Incorporated was aired on December 21st, 2021. This was part of Fox Tell Australia's 12 Days to Christmas Marathon, where for some reason this was the only Scooby-Doo series shown. 36 episodes aired in a row, though out of order. Red Night Fright In Crystal Cove Online, the monster Night Fright is red for some reason. In the show, he's grayish blue, which must have been a change made later on during production. I prefer him looking like this though, as he looks weird red. It must have been an earlier design choice that the game developers used, since that level was made at the same time. Mr. D Dirty was black. In a similar case to Night Fright, Mr. D Dirty was shown in as a different color, but this time the change was a lot more notable. He's shown to be African American in the game instead of Caucasian like in the episode where the cicada calls. Obviously, I have no idea why they changed this, but it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Soundtrack Release The official soundtrack to the series has never been fully released, which is odd due to the popularity of the show, though since 2020, many pieces to it have been leaked online by various fans. A SoundCloud account by the name of Scooby Music uploaded 16 of these tracks, including the resolution music.
Mr. E's theme. And Aphrodite's theme. Last year, YouTube user R4Music began uploading these and some other additions like several songs from the show, though these are not official by any means. You can also easily find the soundtracks of Crystal Cove online, which I have been using as background music for this entire video. Sheriff Stone's name. In the episode Dead Justice, Sheriff Stone mentions that his full name is Sheriff Bronson Stone. As in, his first name is Sheriff and his middle name is Bronson. This was mainly meant as a gag and seems non-canon. Mayor Nettles refers to him throughout Season 2 as Bronson, and it would be really weird to refer to somebody by their middle name at all times. Kobe Toys In 2013, the toy company Kobe released various playsets based on Scooby-Doo. These are pretty generic and not based on any particular series, besides two of the figures. The Blind Bag series featured two Mystery Incorporated villains, the Man Crab and the Freak of Crystal Cove. This theme seemingly didn't sell well, as the license was bought by LEGO not too long after. LEGO released various Scooby-Doo sets in 2015, though these also didn't sell well. Maybe in an alternate timeline, LEGO released Mystery Inc. sets alongside the show airing. Tenacious D Episode 44 was originally going to have Jack Black and Kyle Gass guest star. Mitch Watson's friend Bob White wrote the script, with the two men of Tenacious D writing the music. Kyle would have been the star of the episode, with Jack's character always being in the shadow, though sadly this never came to be due to legal issues. The lawyers of the show and the band got pretty heated, so Mitch had to redo the entire episode. This ended up becoming Dance of the Undead, with Dave Wakeling of The Beat and General Public guest starring instead. Not only did he perform as Rude Boy, but he also wrote both Your Dead Right Mate and Good Bad Girls. Quentin Flynn plays Rude Boy's non-singing voice, and he also played Gus Boggs and Fancy Pants. Similarities to Gravity Falls Now, I'm not claiming one show stole ideas of another, but both Mystery Incorporated and Gravity Falls have similar story beats and elements to one another. You have the main cast of Five in a small town, with the tourist industry of that place based on the bizarre supernatural forces that reside there. Each episode revolves around solving little mysteries, all building up to one big one. One of the villains sets off to unleash great evil, which ends up engulfing the town in fire and transforming it into hell. That villain only gets defeated by literally erasing it from existence, by none other than the show's goofiest main character. Both shows aired for two seasons, though had decently open enough endings if the series was to potentially continue. I love both of these shows, though of course I prefer Mystery Inc. Plus, Pericles is a better villain in my opinion. The original creators hated the show. Now, there are a lot of conflicting reports on this, but apparently the creators of the original 1969 series disliked Mystery Incorporated. Joe Ruby and Ken Spears reportedly hated it for being too dark and cynical, and the characters changing too much. Though, that last part leads to conflicting reports as others say the characters' personalities were based on the original concepts for the 60s show. Mystery Incorporated shows off the backstory and character motives that couldn't be properly expressed decades ago. Maybe they didn't like the final product, but who cares what they think anyways. Adaptations can be different enough without changing to what made the original great. Mystery Inc. took previous elements and added new ones to make it better. Fred has Asperger's In the interview, Mitch mentions his great experiences working with Frank Welker. Frank loved the changes made to Fred's character, as it made him more than just some stud who says a couple of lines before making a trap. Fred was portrayed as being on this spectrum, specifically having Asperger's. This is why he's so obsessed with traps and is shown to be socially awkward, in particular with Daphne as he is shown to be a bit obsessed with her. He wants to keep things obtained and not let them go, as he's scared of losing people due to what happened with his fake mother. Scooby and Pericles are part Anunnaki. It's revealed during the final episodes that talking animals are descendants of the Anunnaki, a race of beings from another dimension. They visit Earth every few thousand years during the time of Nibiru, and possess the bodies of animals since they have no physical forms themselves. Scooby and Pericles are born from ancestors of the Anunnaki, explaining why they can talk and other animals can't. This also leads to them having longer lifespans and increased intelligence. 
This explains why Pericles has been alive so long. African grey parrots normally only live for 20 years in the wild and up to 60 years domestically, but it's been shown that he's been alive since at least the 1930s. And come on, you know he supported Hitler. He could be 80 to almost 90 years old by the time this show takes place. This also explains how Scooby, who's probably like 18, is still alive. Pericles' Jealousy In the episode Grasp of the Gnome, Velma receives a clue by most likely Ed Machine. It reads, Don't give up, this has all happened before. What this is most likely referring to is the love triangle between Shaggy, Scooby, and Velma, as just a second before, Shaggy chose to hang out with his dog instead of her. This implies a theory that something similar happened with the old Mystery Inc. Cassidy being into Ricky must have caused a rift between him and Pericles, leading to the parrot hating her. This might be why their relationship never worked out and why Pericles so desperately wanted her dead decades later. The Real Crystal Cove The show's location name might have been based off of Crystal Cove State Park. Now while it's not a town, it's still a tourist site located near where the show's Crystal Cove would have been located. It's less than an hour south of Los Angeles. Howard E. Roberts and Mark D. Chapman this is a really dark theory I made up in my original Mystery Incorporated video back in 2019. In the episode The Shrieky Madness, Howard E. Roberts is an obsessive fan of the author H.P. Haycraft, so much to the point that he disguises himself as one of his monsters to silence critics. Over the course of the episode, he grows to hate H.P. and plots to kill him once he disavows his work as fake. Mark David Chapman is a man who killed renowned musician and former Beatles member John Lennon. He used to be a massive fan of the Beatles, but turned against them due to a few reasons. The main reason being John's 1966 remark that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. Mark, being a massive Christian, took offense to this. Mark would shoot Lennon a total of five times on December 8, 1980, just hours after Mark took pictures with him. Both are mentally disturbed men who took to killing the men they used to obsess and idolize over after they said one thing they didn't like. It's a bit far-fetched, but I think it's an interesting parallel. Though of course, H.P. Haycraft managed to survive, though it was clear that this almost wasn't the case. Howard nearly dropped him from the roof to his death, if not for being distracted. Again, another dark scene from the show that doesn't get talked about as much. Crazy that this was in the same episode as the Happy Tapioca joke.